Folks at home, welcome back to the Crimson Oak Pond, and if you're new to this series, we built this five acre pond over the past year, and it took us several months to get all of the dirt excavated, and we had to bring in several truckloads of clay, and we also built an island, a dock, and got all the structure in place, and then it took a couple of months to get it full of water. After that, we stocked it with a bunch of bait fish, including bluegills and threadfin shad, and not long after that, we stocked it with these little two inch aggressive bass. And we're going to be giving you an update on them here in just a minute and showing you how big they've gotten because these little guys have grown up and gotten extremely aggressive and you'll be seeing some cool shots of that here in just a moment. And we're also going to be draining the prawn pond today and we had some surprises in there where the prawns got bigger than I expected. And as always, there's going to be a variety of clips out here where the wildlife enjoy in the pond. And we even got to see a close up of one of the owls as well as a couple of animals having a turf war over this section of the pond. But today we're going to start out with one of my favorites, and that's the aerial shots of these schooling bass attacking bait fish. And this time of year, the pond is abundant with a variety of different type of bait. And when that weather starts cooling off in the fall, they move to the backs of the coves and shallow pockets in the pond. And these tiger bass will school up and work together to ambush them. And at first, we were seeing smaller schools of like four to six bass working together. But here recently, I've seen some big schools of over 20 bass. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun watching them because when one of them attacks, it triggers the rest. And it's like fireworks going off. But I did learn something over the past couple of weeks. And in our last video, we weren't sure if the bass were schooling up chasing the threadfin shad or the baby tilapia. Well, this past week I was out fishing and I saw a school of tilapia come nearby. And you could see that some of them were albino. Well, not long after that, I started seeing baby tilapia cruising the banks. And sure enough, some of them were albino, just like their parents. And that was the key giveaway, that tilapia are one of the main food sources that these bass are after. So not only are baby tilapia slow in comparison to bluegills and threadfins, but those albino ones also stand out and make an easy target for the bass. But I saw some very interesting things watching these schools. First of all, it looks like one of the bass has a camera strapped on his back. And we did do that experiment a few weeks ago. But my camera was white, not black. So I can't really tell if this bass has some algae on its back, but I'm kind of starting to think it's got some black pigmentation. But I also want you to pay attention, as this school of bass crosses that laydown, you'll notice there's a unique looking fish right there. And as they circle back around, you'll get a lot better look at it. And at first I couldn't tell exactly what it was, but from this angle I'm starting to think it's one of those big tilapia. And again, that one even had a different unique look that makes it stand out and an easy target. But as much as I love this type of footage, it's probably gonna be short lived because we have some cold fronts moving through. And typically when those water temps drop, all the bait fish and bass pull off the banks and head for deeper water. And even though these bass will still school up and be just as aggressive down in the deeper water, unfortunately we won't be able to see them and film them. And another thing that may come with the cold weather and water is that a lot of the tilapia may not survive but that'll probably come much later in the year, like in January or February. But if you missed the prawn stocking earlier this year, these adult prawns can get up to 16 inches in length, and they've got those long, skinny pinchers. But we stocked 7,500 post larvae right after they were hatched, and they were only about a quarter of an inch long. All right, for those of you not familiar, this is our prawn pond, and they've gotten much bigger. We've been trapping them and moving them out there into the five acre pond to feed the bass. And now it's time to completely drain this pond because we're gonna come in and build an aquascape pond with a nice big waterfall feature. That's gonna be a really cool project coming up here in just a couple of weeks. So most of the prawns that are left in here are gonna be big. So I have a feeling when we drain it today, we're gonna see some big boys because I've mostly been trapping them. Let's see if anything's in these traps. And all the ones that are left are gonna be too big to fit in the traps you can see so perfect feeding size for all the bass out there in the five acre pond and a little added bonus we've had thousands of these mosquito fish in this pond so the bass have been very happy with this project now let's check this one last trap let's see if anything's in it ton of the mosquito fish so we'll do a feeding later on them tonight but first let's drain the pond all right, this is the pump we're gonna use to drain it. All right, just turn the pump on. Got it ran up here for now. 
Yeah, we are pumping water out. Might use it to water some of the oak trees up there. Shouldn't take long though, it's pretty good flow. All right, while we're draining it, I decided to go ahead and get down in the pond and start scooping around. And check out what we caught here. So we got a couple of prawns here, but I think we may have a pregnant prawn right here. Check that out. I didn't think that these prawns could reproduce in fresh water. I thought they had to have brackish water, but it looks like this one has hundreds, if not maybe thousands of eggs in there, which I'm not sure, maybe shrimp are just like bass and they need a male to fertilize the eggs so they'll reproduce. But I thought that was pretty cool. Pretty good size too, almost as long as my hand. And I don't know if you guys can see those ripples, but there are hundreds of tiny minnows in here. So when we get down to the end of it, I mean, they're too small to even make it in the net right there. But when we get down to the end, I may pump the last little bit of water over there into the pond. And we're gonna be showing you the prawns we caught out of the pond. But first, a quick message from today's sponsor. And today's video is brought to you by Factor. And for those of you that have watched my channel over the past several years, you know how much I love to cook. But I have to admit, when you have those busy days where you're spending all your time on projects, there's nothing better than coming home to a pre-cooked, healthy meal. But the first thing that impressed me about Factor is their meal selections, because they have a lot of the types of food I like to eat. Steak, chicken, fish, vegetables. But one thing I really like is they typically add some sort of sauce or different cheeses, and will sometimes even spice it up. And Factor even offers meals for different types of diets, including keto, low calorie, or vegetarian. And they have over 27 different meal options each week. And a typical meal plan will range from four to 18 meals per week. And you can even add or reduce that number based on your specific needs. And one of the best parts is there's no prep work or mess to clean up. And since the meals aren't frozen, all you have to do is spend about two minutes heating them up and it's time to eat. So if you're interested in checking them out, either click the link in my video description or head over to go.factor75.com and use my code P-O-G-B-A-M-A-O-C-T-50 for 50% off your first box. And for a little added bonus, they also send out smoothies or keto shakes, which are a perfect little snack for days out here at the pond. Gotta love it. So here's a look at some of the bigger prawns I caught so far. I got them moved over into a holding tank, but I think we got three bigger males and two females. Here's a look at one of the bigger males that I caught. That is what you call one jumbo shrimp. A lot of people would love to cook him and eat him for dinner. And here's a look at another female. And if there's anyone out there that knows if these eggs will hatch in fresh water, leave it in a comment down below. We've been in a drought. If you ever want to get some rain, start draining the pond. 100% guaranteed, rain's coming. All right, we're getting real close. This is the deepest part of the pond, so all the bait fish and prawns have headed over there. I can see some little smoke clouds where you can see those prawns moving that direction but i'm about to have to relocate the pump out there to the deep end and i'm gonna try to stay out of it for as long as i can because i don't want to dirty up the water i'd like for it to be clean whenever we get all the bait over there so i can get in there with a dip net and see them all right the water's finally gotten low enough that we can see some of the prawns but they're kind of hard to spot because they camouflage in with the bottom of the pond really well and i'm noticing there's a good variety of sizes but let me introduce you to granddaddy prawn this guy has grown much bigger and much faster than the rest of them. And it kind of even looks like he's chasing one of the other prawns around the pond right now. And that is one of those interesting facts about them. They'll only grow as big as the body of water they're in because they compete for food sources. And if they're eating enough food in there, they'll start eating each other. All right, I built a little ramp down in there. And the problem is the moment I step down in there, it's gonna become basically a muddy mess. And right now I can still see all of them swimming around. And I have a feeling once I step in there, I'm not gonna be able to see them. So I'm gonna try to grab a long net and just scoop them off the bank as many as I can before I actually have to get down there in it. All right, that's some of the bigger ones right there. We got five of the bigger ones. I think two or three of these are females. That one's got plenty of eggs. We're gonna go ahead and release them into the pond. Not sure if anything's big enough to eat those guys, but that one's got some pinchers. <laughs> Another female.
We don't know if they got the prawns or the bait fish, but <laughs> bass just busted right there in the shallow area when I released them. Bass could still eat those. A little bit bigger. So I've caught a bunch of them, but I still hadn't caught that really big one with long pinchers. He's down there, probably hiding in the mud somewhere. So I'm gonna let things clear up. You can see it's kind of gotten cloudy. I'll come back out here later and try to see if I can spot him. All right, this is about the fifth bucket I've scooped out of the pond. It's a pretty good variety of size in there, but I'm basically just bringing them over and pouring them into the pond. So now it's time to check in on the Eagle Tower cam. It's absolutely got one of the best views of the pond, and I knew it would only be a matter of time before one of the owls that we call Hooter and Al Capone showed up at the Eagle Tower. So we built this tower in hopes that eagles would build a nest here and we'd live stream it to you guys. But I've always kind of secretly had this hope that the owls would nest here as well because they've been with us since the beginning of the pond build and this is basically like their home. But as some of you stated in the past and I did a little bit of research, it's very rare for owls to build their own nest. <laughs> They're more of a lazy creature so they typically prefer to use an abandoned nest that was built by an eagle or osprey the year before. But one thing I was kind of surprised about with these owls is how big their feet are. Because <laughs> most birds have tiny feet. And I'm pretty sure those things have some grip strength to them, so <laughs> those mice don't stand a chance. But back to the nesting question. So I asked you guys in a previous video if I should build a nest or maybe even put some sticks up here for the birds to start building the nest. And the majority of you all said, no, just leave it as is and let the wildlife come and do their thing naturally. So even though there's a good chance that if I built a small nest up here, the owls may move in and nest in it, we're going to leave the platform empty and let the wildlife do its thing. So in our last video, we had a really interesting pair of birds show up to the Eagle Tower and they were catching dragonflies and bringing them up and eating them on the tower. And I asked you guys to leave a comment if you knew what type of bird it was. And there were hundreds of comments, but it was almost a 50-50 split. Half of the people said it was an American kestrel, and the other half said it was a peregrine falcon. And so I tried to do a little research, and I'm kind of torn because here's a picture of an American kestrel, which looks exactly like it. But the one thing that I noticed that stood out is in this image, the kestrel has orange feet. But this particular bird has yellow feet. So I got some more close-up shots of them. And I'll try to get zoomed in so we can see all the different features. But the most unique feature that I've seen on both of these birds is that on the back of their head, their feather pattern kind of looks like an eyeball. And then they also have that checkered brown and white look on their feathers as well. So I've got an idea of what I think it is. But after seeing this extra footage, if you guys want to leave another comment down below on what you think it is, and we'll try to settle this once and for all. Now let's check in on the Bonnie's Bayou Cam. It's quickly becoming one of the wildlife favorites. Every morning and evening we'll have the deer stopping by to take a drink. And there's a nice buck walking through at night. And a cool shot with a full moon in the background. And bass chasing those tilapia early one morning. And Mr. Longneck coming out to eat tonight. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on here. He got excited about something. And I'm not sure why all the deer cross right here in this one particular area. And I'm kind of thinking that maybe it's an old trail that they used to use before we built the pond here. Or maybe it's even a new trail that they built after the pond was built. Because I know that a lot of times deer will use the same trail. But I'm not sure why they made it right here cutting across this corner because it doesn't save them that much time just cutting that corner. So I'm guessing it's got to be the fact that most of them just started coming up to this area to drink out of the pond and then just decided to cross it. But I'm happy they did because I'm getting some pretty amazing shots early in the morning and late in the evening and I love watching them. <laughs> and that's a small herd of them. And it's feeding time out here at the green lights at night. So tonight we're going to feed the bass some of the prawns we caught out of the pond, as well as some of those mosquito fish. And if you missed our previous videos, I've been working hard for the past year to try to get some of these bass to come up 
during feeding times and I wanted to start off getting them comfortable at night and then hopefully they may start coming up during the daytime as well. But right now we probably got 10 or 12 bass that'll come up when I feed them at night. Unfortunately, Bonnie and Clyde still haven't shown up during one of the feedings at night. Although if you missed the last video, we did spot them in some of the drone footage. So that was pretty cool. But as you can see, these bass aren't as shy as the rest. And it's kind of cool. It's like having some pet bass in your own pond. But speaking of pet bass, the only bass we still have in an aquarium right now is our small bass tiger. And we initially caught him out of this five acre pond and put him in a 50 gallon tank. And then not too long ago, we moved him into the 300 gallon tank. So I was asking you guys what you thought I should do with him. And a lot of people said, let's move him back to the five acre pond. But as I was thinking about it, we're about to build the aquascape pond out here and we're getting started on it in a couple of weeks. So that brought up one extra option. Should we move Tiger to the five acre pond where he started out or should we move him to the new aquascape pond where we'd be able to see him and observe him a lot more? So I'll leave that up to you guys. Let me know what you think about it. All right, time to see how big the bass have gotten. I'm gonna be fishing with a chatterbait today. Every fish we catch, we're gonna scan it. You can see that's the pit tag on the last fish we caught. And if it doesn't have a tag in it, we'll inject one with this pit tag injector. And the goal for today is to catch a two pounder. While I was out here working on the prom pond today, the bass were just cruising these banks, chasing bait. So since it's so shallow, I'm gonna swap back over to the frog right here in this area. All right, I just saw some bass chasing on that bank right there. Got him. <laughs> that little school of them right there. Probably gonna be some more with this guy. Good one. I think we got our two pounder. If not, it's gonna be really close, but I bet you that's two pounds all day long. All right, this fish has been caught, 570540. is 16 inches long. Longest fish we've ever caught. All right, moment of truth. Can we get a two pounder? 2.09 pounds, 2.09 pounds. That's awesome. So we got us a contest winner. Extremely healthy fish, got a little green dot right there on his forehead. Let's get her back out here in the water. <laughs> little frog eater. All right, so we have a new contest winner and the first tagged bass to make it to two pounds is named Yoshi. So that means Josh Cobb is the winner. But here's a couple of interesting facts about Yoshi. We previously caught her twice back in May, and there was a big weight jump from 1.12 pounds to 1.54. So most likely, Yoshi is a female and had spawned out and was recovering and regaining that weight back in May. And Yoshi's gained over a half a pound in less than five months, so that's pretty impressive. So congratulations, Josh Cobb. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Came out from under that weed pile over there. Sitting right up under those weeds right there. Alright, this fish has been caught. 570148. 15 inches. And this fish weighs 1.85. That's a good one. And this fish is named Flipper. We've caught Flipper three times now. And he pretty much lives right around the dock. Oh. He didn't want to hit the water. Nice one. That's got to be a first for me in a long time. Actually backlash, just a tad. He ate it while it was sinking down. It's a good fish, too. Oh, no. Oh. Wow. Hook came out right at the bank. And I got him. That's another one pushing two pounds. That was a wild catch. All right, he's been caught. Six, nine, five, eight, seven. Fifteen and a half inches. This fish got some girth on it. I bet you it's going to weigh two pounds. All right, it weighs... 2.20 wow man that's what i'm talking about biggest bass we've ever caught or grown out here at the crimson oak gotta love it 
Now this big bass is named Lily, and Lily has to be one of my favorite fish in the pond. And there's a very interesting story about her. The first time we ever caught her, I released her, and about 15 minutes later, I cast to the exact same spot with the same exact lure and caught her again. So Lily is extremely aggressive. Obviously you can tell with her weight, basically outgrowing every other fish. And another interesting fact about Lily is she was also the first tagged fish that we caught to weigh a pound. And had we not just caught Yoshi before this one, she would have also been the first fish to weigh two pounds. Good one. Nice healthy fish. He's been tagged before, 570799. 14 and 3 quarter inches. And this fish weighs 1.69, 1.67 pounds. And this fish is named Ukulele. It's also the third time we've caught it. And we caught it just about four weeks ago. And you can see the tilapia are putting the weight on it. Oh, look at there. Right when that bass hit, I just noticed some baby tilapia. They're like little albino looking things. That's what these fish have been up here eating. Now there's a really good look at those baby tilapia. You can especially see those albino ones, but if you look closely, there's some other ones swimming right there with it. All right, I was gonna try to catch one more fish, but that last one stole one of the legs off my frogs. But those tilapia that I just showed you, I think are a big reason why we got a nice uptick in weights. They're easy targets for the bass, and I've been watching them chase them down this bank all day long while I was out here working with the prawns. So the combination of prawns and the tilapia are putting the weight on them, and that makes me happy. All right, we're out here working on our winter crops today, and I'll show you the process really quick. You can see the first thing we did is come out here and bush hog a lot of this grass, basically just cut it down. But one of the benefits of that is, as you can see, the remains of the sorghum and seeded plants we planted this summer, as we cut that down, all of that organic matter will get put right back into this soil. We kind of churn everything up, disc it in. So a lot of that green plant life will be down there and will help those winter crops grow. But this is one of the spots I call the half acre, a really popular deer hangout. We're gonna do Austrian winter peas and then maybe five to 10 acres out here of a variety of seed mix. But you can also see the white oak trees I planted earlier this year. They're doing pretty good. Leaves are just now starting to fall off. All right, got everything bush hogged and now it's time for some seed. All right, let's take a look at what we're gonna be planting. We're gonna start off with the Austrian winter peas. The deer really love those. We'll put those in the half acre and then another spot up here by the pond. And then the WMS Alabama blend. It's an eight part mix, mostly wheat and oats. It does have some winter peas and annual clovers. There's a look at the breakdown. And you never know what you're gonna see out here at the farm, but I have never seen so many caterpillars in my life. I'm not just talking about one or two. There are hundreds of them out here covering this field right now. And I'm sure they were eating on the leaves and plants that we just cut down, but I had no idea <laughs> that that many caterpillars were out here in this field. That's pretty wild. If a bird happens to fly by right now, it's gonna have the feast of a lifetime. Alrighty, I got the fields planted, and you guys know how much I love doing tests on wildlife with different products. So today we have the ultimate test of apples versus acorns. So these are some really cool products where they actually take real apples, crush them up, and make this blend with them. This is like a powder, and then this is a liquid formula, kind of like molasses, as well as an apple-flavored mineral block. So we're going to set out two piles, apples and then acorns right beside it, for the ultimate test to find out which one the deer prefer. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I just heard Hooter or Al Capone right there through the woods. I may have to go over there and see if I can see him up in a tree. But we're getting all this set out. I'm gonna make one pile of apple here. And he's got a lot to say today. Probably trying to find the other one. Then acorn pile over here. Check that out. You can see all the acorns in there. All right, it's pretty obvious. Apple pile here, acorn pile there. Last thing we're gonna do, pour some liquid kind of right here around the edges. So typically you'd pour this like on a stump or something like that. But since we just have open fields out here and we're doing it for the testing purposes, 
We're just gonna pour it right on top of the pile. <laughs> These deer probably aren't gonna know what to think when they come out here and see this, but I'm just gonna go ahead and say my vote is for the apples. And the first deer to stop by got a little spooked and said, I'm out of here. But it's a pretty common theme whenever we add a new food source. The deer are always skittish and skeptical. And I can kind of see why. I mean, if you put yourself in their position, they're probably wondering who went out and got all these acorns out of a tree, crunched them up, <laughs> and put them right here for us to eat. Definitely not something they see in their day-to-day -day life. Had some more skeptics come out after the sun went down. But they better not wait too long because Mr. Raccoon has shown up. And if you watched our previous videos, they love marshmallows. So I'm almost positive they're going to love that molasses. And it's not going to take them too long to eat it. But all the early indicators seem that the wildlife are eating the acorn mix and enjoying it the most. And this could also be a seasonal thing. Because right now all the acorns are dropping and that's something they're used to eating. And apples may work a little better later on in the winter. Because I know these deer absolutely love the apple flavored corn. Look who showed up. The possum George Jones. And would you look at that. Looks like George Jones may have had some babies. I can't really tell about that one on the right. That may be a female possum. But it absolutely looks like the one in the back is a baby. And we got some bucks in velvet stopping by early the next morning. They've just about wiped that acorn pile out. And I didn't really notice any activity around the mineral blocks. And last but not least, I had to show you our little buddy, the spotted fawn. Happy to see he survived. But he does get away from his mama a little too often. Well, the wildlife have spoken, and the acorn is the clear winner. Not by a long shot. They still ate on the apple a little bit, but this time of year, those acorns are tough to beat. All right, time to check in on Moby in the backyard pond and do some fish feeding. And we had several questions about where we get our golden shiners from, and that's Anderson Minnow Farm. You can buy them online, they ship them overnight, and we usually have about 95% of them alive and healthy when they get here. And so we got all the shiners added in the pond and Moby had a good feeding. But look who else came out to eat the giant bullfrog. And he is lucky that he is that big because, as you guys have seen in the past, Moby likes to devour food without even looking at it. But that's one frog that I don't think he's gonna mess with. But interestingly enough, there are some baby bullfrogs hanging out around the pond. And if I was you, I'd recommend you not jump in. Alrighty, it's time to feed Mr. Tiger. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button to follow along with all the pond builds and wildlife out here at the farm. But I hope you all enjoyed this one, and we will see you all next time.